today on Renewing Your Mind. Well, here comes the cloud, and that's scary enough. They'd just seen the glory, and that terrified them. Now the coup de grace, the voice from heaven. Hey, Peter, James, John, do you know who this is? This is my beloved son. Hear him. The Bible describes the glory of God as radiating, all-encompassing, unparalleled. It dwells fully in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. While on earth, God the Son concealed His glory, but for one awe-inspiring moment, He revealed it to His three closest friends. Hello, and welcome to another weekend of Renewing Your Mind. Today, Dr. R.C. Sproul looks at the import of this event known as the Transfiguration, the moment when Jesus' glory was unveiled for Peter, James, and John. This message is from Dr. Sproul's exposition through the Gospel of Luke. Today, he'll cover Luke chapter 9, beginning with verse 27. Now, here's Dr. Sproul from his pulpit at St. Andrew's Chapel in Sanford, Florida. I'm sure it's the case with the vast majority of preachers that when they rise to exposit the biblical text, they suffer from a sense of personal inadequacy. That's certainly true for me every time I open this book before you. But to speak from such a text as we've heard this morning only exacerbates that sense of inadequacy, because this text brings us literally face-to-face with one of the most profound moments that has ever taken place on the face of this earth. And for me, in just a few moments, to try to plumb the depths of it is not only a Herculean task, but an impossible one. And so we all need the help of God as we contemplate this marvelous event of the transfiguration of our Lord Jesus Christ. However, before Luke gives us that record, he mentions almost in passing the words of Jesus in verse 27, but I tell you truly, there are some standing here who shall not taste death till they see the kingdom of God. There is no consensus as to what moment or event Jesus was referring to in this somewhat cryptic statement, but I will say that there are many who suggest that since Luke placed it right before the transfiguration, that Jesus was referring to their witnessing that transfiguration only a few days after he made this pronouncement. Others have suggested that Jesus was referring to the resurrection, still others to His ascension, still others, to the day of Pentecost, and still others, to the fall of Jerusalem in 70 A.D., which is the view I favor. But just in passing, I note that the language that our Lord uses here involves what we call a a particular negative proposition, signaled by the use of the word some. And in the canons of logic and the laws of immediate inference, when a particular negative is expressed, it assumes also the opposite and equal particular affirmative in simple language. What that means is when Jesus says, some of you who are standing here will not taste death until this event takes place, strongly suggests that some of them would taste death before this event would come to pass, which makes it highly unlikely that just a few days hence, this prophecy would come to pass. It's unlikely that Jesus was saying something's going to happen in the next six or to eight days, and some of you aren't going to live to see it, when we know that all of them did live to see it. So having said that, Let me just dismiss out of hand the idea that our Lord was referring to the transfiguration and then move on to the transfiguration itself. 
where Luke's account goes like this. Now it came to pass about eight days after these sayings that he took Peter, John, and James and went up on the mountain to pray. And then the description of the transfiguration. If you're like me, you sometimes like to speculate about what it would have been like to have been alive during the days of Jesus' ministry on this planet and how wonderful it would have been to have been an eyewitness of the things that he did during those years, to have seen the transformation of water to wine at the wedding feast of Canaan, to see the resurrection from the dead of the widow of Nain's son or Jairus' daughter or Lazarus, to see the other miraculous healings that he performed, or to have been an eyewitness of the resurrection or of the ascension or even of the cross. And when I think about that and try to rate them on a scale of excitement, it's hard to think of wanting to have seen anything more beautiful than the resurrected Christ. But short of that, the one event in all of human history that I wish I could have been an eyewitness of was this one that we just read this morning. That moment when God removed the veil where the concealed deity of Christ burst through the cloak of His humanity, displaying itself in nothing less than the pure radiance and refulgence of divine glory. Only three human beings, nay, five, were privileged to be eyewitnesses of that event. Three contemporaries and two who had been brought there from the past days of history, namely Moses and Elijah. But we're told here that it was only the inner circle of disciples, Peter, James, and John, who were invited to go with Jesus as He went up on the mountain to pray. And the event took place not during Jesus' conversation with the disciples. But the event took place while Jesus was having a conversation with His Father, presumably while He was on His knees, speaking to the Father while Peter, James, and John were merely onlookers and on-listeners, as it were. Suddenly, what the Greek calls a metamorphosis, took place before their very eyes, a radical transformation of the visage of Jesus Himself, where we read that as He prayed, the appearance of His face was altered, metamorphosized, changed. They're looking at Him as He's deep in thought, communing with His Father. And while they're looking at Him before their eyes, Jesus' face begins to shine. And if we look at the other accounts of this in the rest of the Gospels, the shining of His face was so intense that it was as the brightness of the sun. Now, before I go any further, let's think for a second of another episode in biblical history where somebody's face began to shine like this. And you know when that happened, thousands of years before this, in the days of Moses, when Moses ascended Mount Sinai to meet there with God. And after meeting God and beholding a portion of His glory, as Moses began to descend from Mount Sinai, his face became so radiant, it was shining with such a high degree of brightness that when he appeared to Joshua and to Aaron and to the others, they were terrified because his face had been altered and his countenance was now radiating with heavenly glory, that they asked him to put a veil over his face. 
Because when people came close to Moses, the intensity and the brilliance of that shining glory frightened them. But we understand that in that episode in the Old Testament, that refulgent glory that was coming from the face of Moses was simply a reflection. It wasn't the glory of Moses. It didn't come from inside of Moses, but was bouncing off of Moses. Because the glory that was being reflected there was a heavenly glory, a divine glory. And you recall that the Bible says that there are different kinds of glories, different levels of glory, different levels of dignity and weightiness that God assigns to creatures. There's a glory to the sun, a glory to the moon, a glory to the animals, a glory to human beings. But those are all different levels and stages of creaturely glory, none of which can ever begin to approach the transcendent majesty of divine glory. There is a glory, a kabod, a weightiness that belongs uniquely and singularly to God Himself, His eternal glory, which is made manifest throughout history in different times through the appearance of the Shekinah, that cloud of radiance and brightness that blinds those who look at it. It is that heavenly glory that God says He will share with no creature. I will share my glory with no one, saith the Lord. And so He doesn't even share His glory with Moses. He displays it, and it is so bright that the face of Moses can't absorb it. It can only reflect it. Now, the difference between that and the transfiguration of Christ is that in the transfiguration, the radiance on the face of Jesus is not a reflection. It is not a glory from outside of Him that is now refracted and bounced back by His human nature. It's the divine glory coming from the second person of the Trinity who shares the fullness of the divine glory. As we sing glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Ghost as it was in the beginning, is now and forever, shall be the eternal glory of the Son of God that is hidden by the frame of His humanity bursts out. And now they're seeing it on His face and on His clothes. His clothes are altered as well. They become white, whiter than any launderer can make it. White that is pure, without any defect, without any blemish. And so there, as Jesus is praying, and Peter, James, and John are watching this take place, they see the glory of God the divine nature, right before their eyes. And this experience, beloved, left an impression on these men that they were never to forget. Remember how John, who was there that day, began his gospel, and the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And he goes on through the rest of the prologue, and he gets to the end of the prologue, and he says what? And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory of the only begotten Son of God, full of grace and truth. John couldn't write that gospel without first saying, we saw his glory. Later, when Peter writes to the church in 2 Peter, 
chapter 1, he says this, For we did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of His majesty. For He received from God the Father honor and glory when such a voice came to Him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And we heard this voice which came from heaven when we were with Him on the holy mountain. Oh, oh, yes, during the ministry of Jesus and even after His death and resurrection and ascension, Peter had his well-known moments of lapse. But the one thing he never forgot is what he saw on that holy mountain when Christ was transfigured before him. And behold, we read, two men talked with him who were Moses and Elijah. Moses, who represents the law. Elijah, who stands at the head of the long line of prophets. And we can say here that what happens on the Mount of Transfiguration is that the divine nature breaks through in the presence not only of the disciples, but of the law and of the prophets, of Moses and Elijah, who had called the people's attention to the one who would come. And this comes right after the Caesarea Philippi confession when Peter had said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God, that the Messiah would not just be an anointed human being, but He would be the divine Son as well. One of the ironies of this text is that Moses, at the end of his career as the mediator of the Old Testament, the one to whom the angels gave the law to present it to the people. Moses was not allowed to enter the promised land. He could look at it, but God took his life before he could enter the promised land. And now hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years later, he gets into the promised land. And there is Elijah. Both of these men taking a brief vacation from heaven where they beheld the glory of the Father day and night came to the earth to behold the glory of the Son. And Moses and Elijah appeared in glory, the glory they brought with them, and spoke of His, that is, Jesus' demise or decease, which He was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Jesus had told after the Caesarea Philippi Convention, that he had to go to Jerusalem to suffer and to die. We remember that. And now as he is about to make that journey, the Father sends him Moses and Elijah, probably in answer to his prayer. The Scriptures don't say what Jesus was praying about, but given his passion, given the intensity of his prayer in Gethsemane, I can only guess, and it is just but a guess, that he was praying about that cup that the Father had placed before him, and the Father sends him Moses and Elijah to comfort him, to encourage him concerning his coming death. But Peter and those with him were heavy with sleep. And when they were fully awake, they saw his glory in the two men who stood with him. And then it happened as they were parting from him that Peter said to Jesus, Master, it's good for us to be here. Let's pitch three tents. Let's have three houses. I don't want to leave. This is a mountaintop experience I'm never going to get over. I have no interest in going to Jerusalem. I have no interest in going back preaching. I have no interest in doing another day but to stand here and and just bask in this glory. How like all of us Peter was wanting to stay there on the mountain. So we'll make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. We don't mind sleeping on the stones, not realizing what he had said. Again, with all his attempt to encourage Jesus, once more Peter's trying to dissuade him from his destiny. And while he was still speaking, a cloud came 
Was it the Shekinah or an ordinary cloud? Luke doesn't tell us. But a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were fearful as they entered the cloud, which makes me think it was the Shekinah. And a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved son. Hear him. Only three times in the New Testament are we told that God speaks audibly from the heavens. You remember the first time at the baptism of Jesus when the dove descended and the heavens opened and the Father spoke saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Now the message changes slightly. The same affirmation of sonship is given. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. How could you not pay heed and want to hear every word that came out of the mouth of the one who has just been transfigured in front of you? If you've ever tasted the glory of God, if you've ever had the slightest glimpse of the majesty of Jesus Christ, why wouldn't you want to hear everything that he has to say? Well, here comes the cloud, and that's scary enough. They'd just seen the glory, and that terrified them. Now the coup de grace, the voice from heaven. Hey, Peter, James, John, do you know who this is? Do you know who this one is who has just displayed his glory before your very eyes? This is my beloved. This is my beloved son. Hear him. And when the voice had ceased, Jesus was found alone. But they kept quiet. And they didn't tell anyone in those days any of the things that they had seen. Later, of course, they couldn't stop talking about it and told everyone. But for now, it wasn't time for talking. It was time for hearing, which they did. You know, beloved, every one of us in this room who is in Christ Jesus one day will see this same glory. It's inherent in Jesus. The author of Hebrews says that Jesus is the brightness of God's glory. And that when we enter into glory, and our mortal eyes are overwhelmed by the brilliance of the light which we enter. And we try to peer into that light and try to find the source of that light. We'll see Jesus, not for a moment, but forever, in the blinding glory of God. We missed the transfiguration the first time. But God willing, we won't miss it the next time. That's an encouraging promise, isn't it? Every time you read the account of the first transfiguration, you want to experience it for yourself. But as R.C. pointed out, we will see Jesus face to face. You're listening to Renewing Your Mind and Dr. Sproul's sermon titled, The Transfiguration. We're making our way through the Gospel of Luke in these weekend messages. And if you missed the first part of this message or you'd like to catch up on previous sermons, visit our archive at RenewingYourMind.org. Renewing Your Mind is the radio outreach of Ligonier Ministries. One of the ways you can listen to this program is through RefNet, our 24-hour Christian radio network. RefNet features biblical preaching and teaching from Dr. Sproul, the Ligonier Teaching Fellows, and other respected pastors and teachers. You'll also hear daily news briefs, Bible readings, audiobooks, music, and more. To listen to RefNet today, go online to refnet.fm. That's refnet.fm. Or you can download the free RefNet app on your mobile device. Before we go, I'd like to let you know about a free resource we're offering. It's the pocket-sized edition of Dr. Sproul's classic work, 
the holiness of God. If you contact us today, we will send you a complimentary pocket-sized edition. To obtain your copy, visit our website at rymfreeoffer.com. This is an online offer only, so place your order when you visit us at rymfreeoffer.com. Next weekend, we continue Dr. Sproul's exposition through the Gospel of Luke. They realized, at least for the moment, that they weren't simply in the presence of an extraordinary man, but they realized that what they had just witnessed was the work of God, and it displayed His majesty, His glory, His splendor, His grandeur in the healing of this boy. Join us for the message, The Greatest, next weekend on Renewing Your Mind. Oh, Lord.